to um, connect with others and to have ideas. I remember as um, a grade five, we were playing in the, in the schoolyard and I would sometimes invent little games. There would be a certain game and I would create my own version or there would be a school cheer and I'd create my own version. So I think that in some sense, I might have had certain natural, whether it be leadership or just general entrepreneurial sort of ideas that needed to be cultivated. Um, but I would also say that everyone within them has has a lot of potential and we just need to create a learning experience um, in many different environments, both, both in the formal education system and outside of it, to really cultivate and develop those talents and, and capabilities. Um, taking it global, we have uh, over 30 staff that are paid. We have 15 interns that work in our Toronto and New York office every four months and we have 300 contracted volunteers. And our core competencies, we leverage social networks for civic engagement. We have a global online community with young people from every country around the world, 350,000 members. We reached over 10 million unique visitors last year. Um, and we develop a whole range of leadership programs, uh, 21st century skills, through um, programs for educators to train youth and also directly through an e-course that we run for young aspiring social entrepreneurs. And we also facilitate youth voice in decision making. We've worked with over 10 UN agencies over the past decade to help organize youth forums, youth consultations, uh, youth caucuses, uh, youth advisory councils. We've done recruitment and facilitation just to try to help young people have a voice and we've leveraged the power of technology to be able to do so, and this is just a, a screenshot of our, of our site, really focusing on civic engagement. And there's a chapter in MIT Press that uh, does an impact study on our work. And at the end of this presentation, we'll share um, a few of our own impact slides. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, cultivating social entrepreneurship. One of the things that we offer is an e-course, and it's called Sprouts, uh, sproutecourse.org. And we developed this uh, three years ago with support, a grant from the Pearson Foundation. And in the course, there's four different modules. Um, and the modules all have different subsections of content where we give case studies, we give background on you know, what we're looking for. There's a whole range of assignments and collaborative ways that people are able to develop their own project, their own social change project. And so what I'm going to share with you are some of the questions that are included in that Sprout eCourse, but I'm going to personalize it for you um, and just share my own reflections. Um, I, I contributed to developing this curriculum, but we actually had a whole team of experts working with us on creating this curriculum, and we also partnered with Tufts University in the initial stages to create some of our rubrics and evaluation metrics. Uh, for assessment. Um, but I think just reflecting on the first question here of what moves me, um, and I'd actually like you all just to take a moment and jot this down somewhere, whether it be on a pen and paper or on a little, you know, notepad or, um, you know, digitally on your screen. What moves me? And I'll ask, you know, what moves you? And I think this question of what moves me, it, it's just the basis of where great ideas come from. What you see here is a photo of Mike and I rollerblading. We came up with the idea for taking it global literally on that day, that, that's um, uh, rollerblading. And so you're, we're out there and we're rollerblading, just chatting, if we could do anything, if you had all the resources to do whatever you wanted to do, what would you do and how would you do it? Actually, now I just realized that setting was just shortly after the actual day. Um, but basically, the movement of rollerblading, we were not trying to come up with a world-changing idea. We were just chatting while we were rollerblading. And this is the whole point. Where do great ideas come from? You know, we can't just force ourselves to think of great ideas. Um, we need to actually have an open mind. We need to have an open environment. And so when we think about the classroom and when we think about learning environments that are trying to help cultivate great ideas, we need to break out of the confines of the same environment every day. Um, you know, just going outside or going to different creative spaces, um, thinking about even colors and how the colors that are around you on the walls might stimulate a certain kind of thinking. Um, and, and for me, I mean, I love painting, for example, and, and different forms of creative expression. Um, so I think that at the root of creating a mindset for social entrepreneurship, we need to encourage movement and creativity. And that is also very much to the individual, not forcing a certain way of creativity on people. Um, so that's, that's one core question. 
uh, planning with purpose is another part of the section of the course. And uh, the, the reflective question I have for you is, how do I attract like-minded people? Um, and this is actually why the power of technology is, is really so powerful, because sometimes it's not the like-minded people in your own local community that are going to help you fuel your big ideas. They may not be the people that you grew up with. They may not be the people that you just happen to sit with you know, in school. They may. And they may, like, and even in a classroom, you know, you might develop friends based on how people look or what their music interests are or whatever interests that, that they might be. But the power of, of technology is to be able to showcase what your interests are, what you care about, and what you're passionate about. And that's de definitely a way to attract those like-minded people. Um, what we talk about a lot in developing teams is how critical it is that when you want to turn your idea into something real, um, that trying to do it all on your own is, is really limiting. And so being able to actually reach out and find people who share um, a similar passion, a similar, um, a similar vision with you is key. And so we kind of go through this exercise. What you see here is a photo of our core team from 2000. Um, some of those people I went to school with, someone I was on the Youth Advisory Council with, someone read about us in an, you know, in an article. Um, we found people through different, different ways. And, and the point is, is that skills, everyone has different skills and abilities, but when you're trying to develop your initial core team to get off an, a new idea, it's really important that everyone shares that passion and vision and then takes whatever skills that they have and applies it in what, ways that are meaningful to them um, just to get things going. So then we ask ourselves, what resources do I need? And this is also a huge challenge for young people when they're trying to get an idea off the ground. They often think of what they don't have, what they lack. And you know what? This is for people of all ages. We come up with an idea of how we want to improve something, and what we see is obstacles. But we're not able to overcome those obstacles if we can't envision building on what we already have. And that's the whole view of ourselves as assets um, and, and looking at the assets that we have, but also looking at the, the community assets that we might have. Um, we didn't have the funding to be able to kick off this big idea that we had, but we had certain skills. Um, and, and we also knew people, and we talked to people. And, and what you see here is actually a photo from 2002, our first real office space, where we actually connected with someone from the YMCA. And we were able to create a barter arrangement. Our team had technical skills. And so we ran a computer lab for them in exchange for having some office space for our team to work out of. And once we had that office space, we were able to get a, a, you know, all of these volunteers and interns. And we were able to get in teachers to let their students get co-op credits to work with us. So we didn't, money is not necessarily the only resource that you need to be able to get your idea off the ground. And so when we focus on helping young people to think about what they have, you know, it could be um, just different connections that are in their community that might be available to them that they hadn't thought about before. Maybe it's um, that they have one of their coaches of a sports team. They might allow them to use the school gym one night and be able to supervise them to be able to hold a team meeting. Um, so it's very important that we have a mindset of being resourceful. So connecting our idea to action. A question, how do I effectively communicate my message? That is a skill that I continually work to refine and, uh, and develop. This is a photo that you see from the Live 8 concerts uh, that took place. Um, I, you know, I was at the one here in Canada, but these were you know, taking place around the world. And by this point, Taking It Global was involved with them, with our whole coalition on you know, Make Poverty History. And, and we were part of that campaign. And I had this very brief opportunity to be able to say a few words um, on a radio show. And oftentimes, you know, we have this brief moment where we you know, sometimes we feel that we don't have a voice. Then suddenly we have a platform, and you can't say it all. So you have to know what is your key message. And being able to communicate that message effectively is so important to helping that idea gain momentum. And so this is a skill that, you know, within the course that we're looking on developing. But I think that uh, in a lot of the workshops that I do with youth and for yourselves as educators, one very important question that I would challenge uh, you to ask your students is, to help them even know what their message is. Because sometimes people are afraid of their own voice. And they're afraid to even speak up and to, to feel confident even saying what their message is. And then once they found out, you know, this is what I really care about, and this is the message that I have, being able to communicate that message effectively is an incredibly important skill for social entrepreneurship. 
Um, related to asset building, again, what strengths do I build upon? Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, we definitely can't do it all. And, um, but we can aspire for, for it all. And uh, this is a photo of our team doing uh, a team building exercise. Uh, we're based here in Toronto and, and at Centre Island there's this really incredible ropes course. And uh, that was just such a great example of, of how different people within a group, you know, we can lift one another up and just going to how a group is designed but also for yourself. When we're building upon our strengths, we're building on a momentum for ourselves. And so while it's important to pay attention to, to weaknesses, um, well, at least the way that I view it is to identify others where their strength might be your weakness. So sometimes it might be developing that yourself, or it's simply acknowledging that, building on your own strengths, and creating space for others to step in and actually um, and, and have that strength. Another key question is about measuring change. So if we're trying to you know, foster social entrepreneurship. It's not just entrepreneurship for, you know, for making money, um, but it's actually for creating social change. And among the whole sector at large, there's, this is actually a whole new, um, a whole new space in a way, and there's actually not one clear way of assessing how to actually measure your impact. Um, this is something we've been thinking deeply about. One of the things that we've done is to develop our own theory of change. And actually, I was sitting as a judge for the TD scholarship. I'm invited to you know, take part in different advisory councils and um, to actually help assess youth-led projects. So I'm, I'm reviewing different projects at, at different points in time. And I remember sitting there and, and listening to a young per person share their pitch about their project. And actually, I asked them, uh, well, what is your theory of change? How does the action that you're taking right now, how does it actually change the world? Because we know that, um, yes, every act of kindness can go a long way and that there's absolutely a ripple effect. But it's also important for us to start to understand and learn about the different systems that we're part of and how there are many approaches and many ways to create change and that young people have a very important and powerful voice. Um, but it's not to say that it's just all about the youth voice. I mean, we have to look at, for example, if we're trying to change the education system, we need to ensure that we have the voices of students as part of that process. Of course, the, the voices of teachers um, are critical, but also, you know, superintendents and administrators and, um, you know, policymakers, people at the ministry. Um, we need to look at how industry plays a role in driving the future of education. We also want to look at just broader, you know, uh, societal needs and how do you actually create sort of social cohesion and, um, and, and looking at culture. So we don't just want an education system that serves the economy, but we want to contribute to a vibrant culture and we want to look at not only how it will help a nation, but in a global world, how does it actually create global citizens and a global mindset. So when we think about the goals of a system that we're trying to change, we need to look at it from different lenses. And this is actually, if there was one thing that I think would be so critical for even educators to be exposed to because in some case, um, sometimes, you know, we're so focused on a, a very narrow lens of curriculum that when, when that's being taught, we're not actually exposing the minds of students and learners to all of the possibilities that are out there. And when we think about the kind of mindset that global leaders need to have and the kind of decision makers that we need to have in this, in this complex, interconnected, challenging world, um, we need to start to, to allow people to put on those lenses at an early age. Um, there's different projects that we've run where, you know, we, whether it be simulations or, you know, trying to get people to put on different hats. Uh, there's a, a group in um, Uruguay, for example, where they have this, the simulation where students have to decide on the budget of the nation and they have to put on, you know, the hats of these different members of, you know, parliament and they have to come up with a proposed budget for the nation, just for example. Um, so it's not just through simulations. I mean, young people need to recognize their power um, independently of, of all these other power systems, but they also need to know um, how decisions get made and how it's not as simple as the person at the top. Like, for example, you know, the Prime Minister of Canada has limited control. You might think that someone sort of at the top has the most power, but actually power moves and shapes decisions in very different ways. Sometimes power comes from, you know, grassroots. Sometimes it comes from uh, someone who's very intellectual. Sometimes it's research or data. Sometimes it's, um, it's based on emotional decisions. Um, and so, Coming up with your own theory of change is important. This here on the screen is uh, just an overview of our theory of change. Um, what I'd like to do 
now is I know we were going to potentially, Mike has a, a presentation to share. Um, I want to uh, invite him shortly, but I do see that there are some questions here. Uh, that are that are popping up here for me, and I'm just wondering, Gavin, would you like me to take some of these questions uh, now, or should I have Mike present and then come back later, and we'll do questions together? I think uh, you could uh, take one or two of those questions now. So, if you want to pick off, I mean, one of the questions we have is, uh, how have you been able to gr grow your online community so quickly? Okay, um, how have I been able to grow the community so quickly? Well, one, one thing is I would say that it has been a decade. <laughs> so I guess it's not that quick. Um, but I, it did, in a way, it did happen very quickly uh, where, you know, one thing sometimes people make the comment, but how do you engage those who don't care? And actually, I always say that everyone cares about something. And it's just a matter of finding the people who care about the things that you care about. Um, and I would say that the more passionate that you are and the more research that you do on what is already out there. So it's not just saying, like, here's what I care about. Stan. It's just trying to figure out well, what other networks exist, um, what other groups exist, what other organizations exist, what other associations. I mean, when we had this original idea, we just thought we were the only ones in the world that had this idea. And as it turns out, a lot of people, I mean, no one had exactly what we wanted to do, but there were many people that had similar um, yeah, similar mindset. And so part of it was having others get involved in what we're doing, but the other was actually me and, and Mike and others in our network getting involved in other initiatives. So, for example, even just me being here with you all today, um, you know, this is me being involved in your community and your, your network, and hopefully that will attract some of you to be part of our network. So I would say that cross-pollination would be my answer to the I'm first sure, question. I'm sure it will. <laughs> Those connected communities. What, uh, what are some of the motivational strategies that you uh, have used to help youth along the path when uh, obstacles get in their way? Oh, that's a great question. I think the key motivational strategy um, in helping youth overcome obstacles would be helping them think through the solutions themselves and being someone who believes in them that they can figure it out. So, and I go back what that also means for me and the people who have believed in me along the way. Because I've, I've certainly had many people who have felt like, you know, the crazy person and it's a pipe dream and, you know, there's still so much that we're trying to achieve that we're just not even close. But I would say the key thing to helping a young person or also anyone who's facing an obstacle is to be able to ask clarifying questions with a tone. And a key point is the tone because if you have a cynical tone in it, that's going to be discouraging, but with a tone of, of belief and confidence that they can do it. And I think about, you know, pretty much every week I have someone new in our Toronto office, and they're either a current student or they've just come from, from school, and, and the scope of what they're about to do when they join their team is just massive. Same thing, we have new volunteers that are being trained online, you know, all around the world, and they, they hit roadblocks, or youth who are running their projects, and it's just helping to ask a question of, what could you do? And instead of getting them to come up with the ultimate answer, I often ask them to come up with three scenarios. Okay, well, what if you did this? What would happen? And if you did that, what would happen? What would be the middle ground? What would happen? What do you think is the best choice? What course of action will you take? So rather than telling them what to do, asking them what they will do and what would be the consequences of those choices. That's a great answer. Great advice all around. Uh, another one which is similar, sort of looking at a similar area in a slightly different way is uh, how do you get people to understand the power that is really in their hands, the strength that they really have? Ah, uh, I love that question. And to me, that speaks to why taking a global or tigweb.org exists, which is our online global social network for social change, which is about not the technology, but technology is absolutely an enabler. Um, but it's about stories, and it's about people who are inspired. A connected group of inspired individuals. When we look at the impact that, that we have and what motivated someone to actually take a stand, speak up, speak out, lead a campaign, if you look at the source of a lot of their motivation, it's, it's oftentimes that they heard about how someone else with very little um, 
did something amazing. And it was through the stories of other inspired individuals that inspired them to show what was possible. We need to continually demonstrate possibility by sharing those stories. Because oftentimes we're bombarded by the media of devastation, of despair. Um, and so those stories of hope are the absolutely number one. Um, and also not that it's from afar. Like the global element surely is exciting. Um, but, but for example, like within your own school, and also even highlighting just acts of courage and kindness and um, showing how little acts of also leadership ha can make a really big difference. So even within a classroom, showing examples, not just of the person who has, let's say, the, the, the highest grade or, you know, the person who was elected a student council president, but giving the platform for people who demonstrate initiative who may not have a title or designation or, you know, they may not be the quote unquote superstar, but showcasing how that is a fantastic thing, it gives people confidence that there's many ways to lead in the world. I think you're demonstrating by your answers very much the inspire, inform and involve uh, tagline that you have for taking it global. Uh, one further question, what, what's the average age of your target youth, people that are involved in your network? So the average age of those youth who join us through their teachers, through TIGED.org, which is our platform for teachers to take their students into the world of taking it global, almost like a virtual uh, classroom or field trip in a way I sometimes say, uh, those would be teenagers, let's say 13 to 18 for TIGED. But those youth who are in our network on TIGWEB.org, T-I-G-W-E-B.org, which is the main youth to youth peer-to-peer -peer community, they'll either be youth who, who stay on with taking it global after a TIGED experience you know, on their own, but actually they tend to be more like 18 to, to 26. But at, at large, uh, we sort of define you very broadly between 13 and 30, and everyone can join the site of all, um, of all ages, though the programs are targeted for you. That's brilliant, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you very much. I, I think we need to work out a way for a virtual round of applause. Um, but now perhaps you could hand over to Michael. <laughs> well done. And uh, we'll hear from Michael, but stay around for the questions <laughs> that might come at the end, please, if you can. Okay, thanks. Here's Mike. Hi, Mike. Good morning, everyone. You take Hello. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. I will take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, this is just um, a little screenshot of the Sprout program, which is our um, kind of online uh, social innovation kind of boot camp course and program that we run with the Pearson Foundation. Uh, and for those of you who might have students that are kind of exceptional uh, social entrepreneurs or, or high potential social entrepreneurs, you can check out the site which I'm typing, which is sproutycourse.org. And everyone who takes the course is eligible to apply for the Pearson Fellowship for Social Innovation, which gives them a grant of between one and $5,000 to get their project started, and also one-on-one -on -one mentorship to really uh, kick off their initiative. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about a particular uh, idea we've developed uh, and kind of our social innovation strategy around education. And that was really something that I was excited about because I didn't have the most, uh, I would say, compelling or engaging educational experience. And I was really inspired through our work at Taking It Global to try to support and really cultivate a network of schools that are working to leverage the power of technology and social innovation to really captivate their students about their learning by connecting it to kind of real world issues or, or challenge-based learning, as NMC refers to it. And so one of the statistics I found many years ago that kind of really showed the need for this kind of work was this study called Students in Today's Schools that the U.S. Department of Education has been doing ever since the advent of the Commodore 64. I began using technology at a pretty young age. It's not in here, but there's a photo of me at uh, the age of two and a half. I got my Commodore 64 in 1984. And you can see ever since around that time, uh, the answers to these questions, did you find your schoolwork meaningful? Were your courses interesting? And do you think what you learned uh, in school will be important later in life? You can see that responses from students have declined over the years. And they actually haven't done the study again since 2000. So I'm not sure how it's continuing to go. But there's obviously a bit of a, a, a challenge of engagement as technology and, and, um, and kind of the, the combination of technology and entertainment and virtual worlds has gotten more sophisticated. Um, the education system really hasn't been able to keep up in the way that it uh, engages young people. And I, I agree with you, Paul. I think it probably uh, isn't, hasn't changed much. At the same time, the Partnership for 21st Century Skills came about and talked about these important future skills, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, social responsibility. And one of my favorite quotes from their, their report a few years ago was that today's education system 
is really facing irrelevance unless we can bridge this gap. And they refer to the gap as the disconnect between how students live, how they're using all these technologies and the different mediums and worlds and spaces, and how they learn. And, and so about six or seven years ago, we were invited to speak uh, at a conference to educators, and we kind of had a, a resounding enthusiasm about using the potential of some of the things we do on the web in the classroom. And so that led to us launching TIGED that Jennifer mentioned, or Taking a Global for Educators, which is really a community within our network, which is not 13 to 30, but open to educators of all ages. Uh, educators and schools committed to bringing kind of challenge-based learning, global education into their classrooms and, and you know, really using technology to make that happen. And so, so far, since we launched this in 2006, we've had over 2,500 schools in 120 countries come on and join the community and begin to use Taking It Global as part of their formal classroom practice. Uh, and so that's a growing maybe 10 or 15 percent of our global audience of, uh, of millions every year. And one particular program that was recently created that I think kind of showcases the opportunity in building on what Jen talked about around cultivating this culture of social entrepreneurship, it was a group of teachers and students who met last year as part of Microsoft's Asia-Pacific Regional Conference of, of Innovative Schools. And they were inspired by a keynote speaker named Jean-Francois Richard, uh, former vice president from the World Bank, who wrote a book called High Noon, 20 Global Issues and 20 Years to Solve Them. And in his book, he really is challenging everyone, this is you know, many years ago now, um, that if we don't solve these 20 critical global issues by around 2020, the world is going to be in a serious crisis, things like overfishing and, and deforestation. And so these teachers in schools decided they really wanted to do something and pick one of these issues to get started with. And so they created the concept and this idea for a program they called Deforest Action, which is really about engaging schools all over the world, and especially initially in their region, uh, in, in understanding and having an impact on the, the growing kind of threat of deforestation in their, in their communities, in their region. And so we decided to help them out by creating a, a web page for the project and, and facilitating a series of sessions and, and web conferences where their schools interacted with each other um, to really plan out and, and decide what they would do and how the project would work. Uh, we managed to, to connect to a, an expert uh, named Dr. Willie Smith, who keynoted TED two years ago, and is kind of a world-renowned leader. has been working in Borneo for more than 20 years to actually have all of the school's work benefit uh, his kind of efforts to regrow in entire areas of rainforest in Borneo. So you can see here there's some students from, from Canada, from Australia, from Taiwan. There were about 50 or 60 schools in this web conference, and the top left is Willie Smith um, in Indonesia. And the students actually got to meet him. He actually brought, uh, he did one of the web conferences from a zoo and brought an orangutan to connect with them. And so really helping to, uh, to kind of provide them with some of the information uh, and, and kind of resources behind the scenes. National Geographic has gotten quite interested in the project, so there's now going to be a, a, a film uh, being filmed starting in September where we're actually recruiting about 16 young people to go to Borneo, to actually be on the ground, to collaborate and communicate with schools all over the world, and to kind of report on all the things that are happening on the ground. And so to decide on who those 16 people would be, we launched a contest. We had over 250 video entries of people kind of uh, telling us why they wanted to go to Borneo, why they deserve to be selected. And so we're, we've now narrowed it down to the top 25 finalists, and we'll be picking the top 16 soon. And all of those finalists have been paired up with schools to actually virtually or in person go in, collaborate with students, um, you know, help them in their fundraising. And it's been really amazing to me uh, the, the massive um, diversity of ages in which schools and students have participated. These are some photos from a primary school in Australia. And I think some of the most powerful engagement in the project has been through um, you know, the, the, the K to 5 level. We've had some amazing videos created. I'm going to post a, a link here um, to the website where you can actually have a look. And under the video section, there's actually you know, five or six videos created by grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 students working together in the school to talk about why they think this, this issue is particularly important to deal with. There's you know, a, a kindergarten student uh, on our site who has, uh, whose teacher helped her create a blog named Action Anna where she's actually talked about um, uh, her interest in uh, her, how she was inspired by you know, learning about the plight of orangutans and the illegal deforestation. Most of the, something like 75% of the deforestation in Indonesia, the, the logging is illegal. And so part of the challenge is just keeping track of what's going on. And so a big part of this project beyond you know, raising awareness in Australia and Canada now, the Senate have actually um, made statements supporting the project and kind of showcasing 
have students who really demanding change, especially around labeling of palm oil. The Australian Senate just the other day passed a bill um, requiring palm oil to be labeled in products. And in many cases, palm oil is produced unsustainably. And it's in a lot of the products that the kids love, like in Australia, Tim Tams, here in North America, Nutella and Kit Kat. And so there's been some amazing learning uh, going on where students are you know, writing letters to companies, talking to the governments, and understanding how they can, and kind of telling them that they're not really willing to accept the destruction of forests for their favorite biscuits and crackers. So it's, it's really been amazing to see that partnership develop. And so what we've created is the ability for schools to actually, when they fundraise, to adopt a specific area of rainforest. So this is a, an example of a primary school that sponsored you know, 267 square meters of land. They've got the exact longitude and latitude and coordinates. And what we're working on now is a, a program called Earth Watchers, where the students will actually be able to log in, see their area of land, and get updated satellite photos every week so that the students can actually help to report anything that's going on in their land. So if someone comes in and starts logging or disrupting or you know, doing something in their forest, they can actually report it to Willie and his team. And he's got the support of the local community, the Bupati, the police, and everyone there to, uh, to really help to step up and protect the land and the forest. So it's really a, a really innovative global partnership where students are creating their own local kind of social innovations to fundraise, to raise awareness, to get their whole community involved. And then it's kind of aggregated up at the school level. And at a global level, there's kind of recognition for the schools that are participating and that are the most engaged to, uh, to actually track and view their progress. So really excited in particular about this project. Uh, and we'd love for all of you to be involved at, uh, at deforestaction.org, uh, which I'll, I'll post there. And this has really been uh, made possible through an innovative partnership with both um, Orangutan Outreach, which is a kind of expert group with the orangutans, um, at Willie Smith and his team, and also Microsoft Partners in Learning, which is Microsoft's kind of educational program um, to, uh, to engage schools. So we'd really love to have more schools outside of Asia Pacific involved, and I'm hoping that many of you will be interested in joining us. And so Jennifer mentioned at the beginning our impact, and I just wanted to share three or four highlights from our recent impact study. This is something we've been challenged from the beginning when we launched Taking It Global. What kind of an impact can it possibly make for someone to engage and participate in a community like this uh, compared to just reading information on a, in a book or in, in a textbook or just having a local conversation? And so something, a few of the, the highlights we found in a recent study is that 68% of members of our website actually said they gained or refined their skills. And there's a whole kind of matrix of different uh, word that we created of the different words and, uh, and kind of skills that they share they've been able to strengthen through their interaction in the community and through being involved in projects and, uh, and programs. 89%, uh, not surprisingly, said it's increased their cultural awareness. Social networks like Facebook and MySpace are really just about people connecting with their existing networks online, whereas Taking It Global is all about exposing young people and students to countries and places and organizations and ideas and artwork and culture from places they may have never even heard of. And so we're really seeing a, a strong a connection with that in, in that statistic. 66% or two-thirds increased their volunteer activity. We help over 22,000 nonprofit organizations use our site to post resources and volunteer opportunities at and we're thrilled that more than two-thirds of our members say they've increased their volunteer activity as a result of being involved in taking it global and, and finding uh, and getting access to opportunities through the site. 82% say they now talk more about local and global issues. I mean, we're, especially through a lot of the student-led journalism on our site, we have a great partnership with a network of international schools led by the Washington International School. It's called the Student News Action Network, where we have student journalists um, as part of high school programs all over the world posting local news. There's some amazing stories from Japan and you know, schools in Asia and, and, and Africa. And so really being able to connect students with the news and, and, and issues in a way that's relevant to them is obviously coming through. And most importantly, I think in some ways, half of our members say they've actually formed a real friendship through our site. And when you look at a lot of the, the studies and, and literature about kind of the issues young people are facing, like the book Boys Adrift by Dr. Leonard Sachs, he really talks about the lack of role models and mentors and kind of um, positive peers as one of the, the five challenges young people are facing. And if we can get young people to form friendships that really support them through difficult times or inspire them in their programs and projects and act as collaborators for the ideas we have, I think we can go a long way to building a more kind of peaceful, inclusive, and sustainable world, which is a big part of our vision. And so I wanted to 
close our formal presentation and open us up to questions with, with this question um, that Jennifer kind of came up years ago as part of the work I think we're all trying to do as educators and as kind of, uh, kind of working with young people as an audience. And that's that we all wonder if young people were actively engaged in all aspects of society and thought of themselves as community leaders, problem solvers, role models, mentors, and key stakeholders, how would the world change? And that's what we're here to figure out, and we're really excited to uh, have all of you involved with us in this journey, and it was such a pleasure to be able to share our work with you today. We look forward to chatting a bit more through the questions. Thank Michael, you. that's brilliant. Well done. And a, a round of applause to you already uh, as we run to the questions. Uh, one of the questions that's come through is, uh, can you speak a little bit about the tools that you've used to collaborate and communicate with people working on the same project? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that we've done, um, you know, five or six years ago when we um, got started with our education programs, we realized that it would kind of be a challenge to have students just joining our main website and kind of posting things, having teachers be able to kind of manage and control that. And so what we've actually created as part of TIGED is a kind of an online virtual classroom platform where um, teachers can create their own kind of virtual spaces to have the, the privacy and security of their classroom managed, interact with a lot of the same tools we have on Taking It Global, like video chat and art gallery, blogs, discussion boards, all those kind of things. And we've made it very easy for them to both connect their schools together so they can collaborate with other schools very easily, uh, or invite guests and speakers and, and members from our website into their private classroom space. So, those spaces have been so successful and so kind of easy to use. We've now partnered up with a number of organizations that are doing similar work, kind of connecting uh, schools to collaborate around the world, like the city of New York, who runs about 30 different uh, collaborations with their twin cities through our site. Um, that we, so we've kind of built our own suite of tools that sit on top of our community that let teachers and schools do that kind of collaboration um, in a safe and private space. And we're also using those same tools to facilitate programs like Deforest Action. So teachers can go on the Deforest Action site, create their own virtual classroom space completely free, and then partner up with a another school locally or another school in another part of the world to have their students work together to, uh, to kind of solve that problem and, and kind of work through the curriculum. That's great. And uh, we could see more of that on the TIG Ed Wood uh, website, could we not, if we uh, look through that? A question that yeah. reminds me of um, the graph showing the decline in interest or engagement of students. Um, but have you got any messages about the engagement of at-risk students? Have you got any evidence about uh, at-risk students being drawn back into education thanks to your work? Yeah, I think that one of the things that we've really tried to do, um, especially to support students at-risk or disengaged students maybe often, you know, I might have been characterized as one of those in school just having a different learning style that wasn't really met through the traditional way that education was happening. Um, we've done a lot of work as part of the coalition, the Games for Change coalition. Uh, in particular on our site, we've created about a half dozen games to really help uh, bring several different issues to life, things like health, uh, political science, global poverty, through kind of simulations and, and online games. And so that's really been uh, our contribution to the effort to really say, well, if students aren't learning effectively through you know, traditional instruction, um, being able to play a game like the AAT game, which is an online kind of simulation, almost like The Sims, uh, how a family could survive in Haiti. I'll, I'll paste the link into the browser. Um, and then having a conversation and, and really digging deeply into what they learn through playing those kind of games. Um, th that's really, I think, a, a strong uh, opportunity. When you say at-risk students, I, I really imagine anyone who's disengaged in their education, all of those, uh, you know, that declining percentage there, I think that the majority of students, if you, if you look at the engagement graph, are potentially at risk of being disengaged by their education. I think that one of the things we've done to try to contribute to um, supporting different learning styles is the games in education. But more broadly, I think this kind of challenge-based, inquiry-based, global issue-based learning has a huge opportunity to engage them. And uh, Gavin, we've talked about this before, but a study that we saw almost a decade ago was looking at the interest in social issues that people had throughout their lifetime. And it peaked around grade five or six. And so I think we have a huge opportunity, uh, almost a huge responsibility, to really cultivate that interest, captivate their enthusiasm and, and their inspiration 
states. And I think their feeling of empathy towards, in, in the deforestation case, um, the orangutans and the animals that are being injured and, and their habitat being destroyed, or whatever issue it is they care about, if we can connect them to an opportunity to do something about that issue around that you know, grade five, grade six period in life, I'm convinced that we'll, um, we'll really solve some of those problems of disengagement later in high school because they'll be captivated by their learning and education and, and inspired by the ability they have to make a difference that they've, that's been revealed. And uh, I think it could potentially go a long way towards addressing some of that disengagement or, or risk that they face by not being engaged in their education. I, th I think that's a fantastic bit of research that shows that the social interest of students is not something that comes late in life, but something that comes early. Uh, uh, and that's something we would do well to, rem to remember. So that's, that's great stuff. One thing, uh, how do you uh, relate what you're doing on taking it global to uh, the formal education system? And have you got any way of assessing youth engagement, uh, both generally and even in real time because you, of the technical teams that you're, uh, tools that you're using? It's definitely something that we're uh, interested in doing. Uh, we want to develop more, more thinking around. I think that you know, there's obviously a lot, of, um, a lot of tools built into the platform so, so an educator can uh, kind of really give a very open-ended assignment to their students. They can say, you know, uh, reflect on or create some kind of a reflection on the role of a palm oil in, uh, in, in deforestation. And what students can do is they can create that reflection or kind of post content in any format. They can post a discussion board comment. They can upload a, a photograph or create a piece of artwork. They can, you know, really uh, contribute or participate in the online community in any way. And they can tag that contribution to the, the community uh, with that assignment. And so it makes it really easy for educators to kind of assess or at least track what it is that they've done to respond to that particular assignment or activity. Um, in terms of what we can do to intervene if learners aren't engaged, uh, it also kind of makes it easy for educators to identify students that either haven't logged in or haven't posted or haven't contributed. So I think that you know, what we're always trying to do and what some of those impact uh, study slides show is, is really better track and monitor and understand the impact of this kind of web-based youth engagement. Um, but I think it is definitely a skill that, uh, that needs to be built on the side of educators as well. And, and we've worked with um, Plymouth State University and, and a retired teacher that's a big champion of our work at Taking It Global to develop two professional development courses uh, one on global education overall, and one specifically on this kind of challenge-based, project-based learning uh, to really help educators build, I think, the skills and competencies and, and, and collaborate with each other to think about how they can most effectively deliver and assess these kind of program projects. So I think, unfortunately, this is not a short answer, but we are really trying to develop more professional capacity around supporting and developing these kind of projects. And we'd love to have educators from, from all of your schools join the next uh, cohort of those development courses in September. So I've posted the link there for you to find out more about, uh, about those That's formal great. I, I think, I mean, what, what I think is uh, really inspiring is that you're, you're addressing the issues of disengagement uh, or, or youth engagement at its source. So you're getting to, to young people before they uh, disengage, and I think engaging their interest. Just uh, moving now to, uh, do you have any advice? And you've partly answered this already, but do you have any advice for educators wanting to try a global action project in their classroom, and perhaps who have no experience of having done it before? Yeah, I think the best advice really is just to, to get started, to um, to kind of find another school or, or or kind of a project that they're interested in and just um, try it out. I think that. Um, it's really just about finding something that connects to their, their students' interests or, or the subject or topic. But I think that it doesn't, um, it, it can be as simple as just participating in a discussion. Um, I think sometimes people are a bit overwhelmed by the, the number of opportunities there are in something like deforest action to, to participate in every possible way. But it can be just as simple as you know, having a, bringing a guest, bringing one of the action agents, for example, into their classroom virtually to speak to them about the project and, and how schools have been involved. But I think my advice is just to, to get started, to not be afraid on the technology side, and to really um, try to create an experience where the students have shared ownership over that collaboration and that experience. And I think what will happen very quickly and what we often see 
the students get engaged very quickly, far above and beyond the kind of confines of the classroom space. You know, they're logging on on weekends, they're contributing um, you know, constantly. The kind of environment that these type of virtual global collaborations provide are incredibly engaging for students because it allows them to really extend their own personal interest and curiosity far beyond the homework and far beyond the classroom. And so I think my advice would be just to get started now. Um, through a website like ours, they can go into the community and find a school in any country they're interested in. Um, but they could even uh, get started by finding a, a buddy school down the street and just experimenting with a, uh, you know, getting another classroom involved with them to participate that they can kind of share best practices with and, and share knowledge with. But I think that the simplest advice is just get started now, try it out, and, and begin to learn quickly from the experience. So it's a bit of a sportswear answer. Uh, just do it. I think is how somebody put it. Um, a final question, Michael, and uh, before I just move to uh, finishing off. But uh, we we discussed a little bit of this uh, last week, I think. Uh, but how, what's your call to action to uh, members of the New Media Consortium and the HP Catalyst Project? Uh, how can they help connect with schools or youth groups and help uh, connect with taking it global? Um, well, that's a great question. We'd very much love to have all of you involved and to support that in many different ways. Um, I think that the simplest way is that they can visit the, the TIG website, uh, which we've shared the URL for there. Um, they can you know, begin to explore the resources and community there and sign up to be a part of that. We'd love to have their schools. We'd love to have more schools involved deforest action and from the deforest action homepage there's a, a direct link to a teacher's zone where we have a teacher's guide and we have links for both primary schools and middle and secondary schools to create their classrooms and get started so we'd love to see them join that and uh, we, we'd really love to, to have them join the professional development program there some of their teachers participate uh, because we really want that to be a global learning experience last last cohort of courses we have teachers from eight or nine different countries learning together about global education and learning about it in the exact kind of environment they'll be using with their students. So um, we're really excited to have all of them involved. And of course, anything that all of you can do to share these opportunities and resources with other schools would be greatly appreciated. As a, as a small nonprofit and charity, our marketing budget is <laughs> but yay big. So we always appreciate that sharing of resources. And we're just excited to have the kind of schools that, that the Catalyst program represents, you know, really forward thinking at the kind of leading edge, I think, of innovation creativity in this kind of global education and challenge-based learning space, uh, we really, really can't be, couldn't be more excited to have all of you on board and involved. So we're just really grateful for the opportunity uh, to Larry and Gavin to having us, both Jennifer and I, join today to share our work with all of you. Thanks. Michael and Jennifer, thanks a million for today. That, that's been really terrific. As, uh, as Sam has already said on the IM, um, the conversation doesn't end here, and I hope there'll be lots of good things that come as a result of it. Thanks, too, to everybody who's listened in, and thanks to the NMC team as a whole for uh, setting this up and making it all happen so smoothly. So thank you, and uh, goodbye.